TV18. Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV18 Investment Guide. I'm Surabhi Upadhyay and as always with me is Anuj Singhal and we are here with another very, very interesting guest with another very interesting theme. Now, Anuj, this morning I was looking at uh, Morgan Stanley's overall note on emerging markets, mm -hmm. which was, of course, uh, written by Jonathan Garner and his team. And it caught my eye because they said, you know, what eight reasons why emerging markets, the index, that is the MSCI EM, could have peaked for the year and then I saw the last line of that note saying yeah. India mm -hmm. is perhaps an exception and this market will perhaps outperform. You know what, yes, uh, but you know, Surabhi, what we are discussing here in Investment Guide is not what this market will do for the rest of the year, right? Uh, what we are discussing is whether we are at the cusp of something big. Yes. You know, the, something big like we saw in 2003 to 7 phase. I think people have seen a lot of bull markets. I would still say that, you know, the 2003 to 7 bull market mm. was perhaps the mother of all bull markets. I mean, I think, I think that was the period in which, you know, really it was, it felt like bull market. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, I mean, you felt that in between here and there, but that was the market in which, and not just uh, bull market in terms of, uh, you know, stock prices doing well, mm. but for the, for the economy, you know, for, for your, for your salary growth. People uh, felt pe good. People felt yeah. good. You know, year after year, you were getting 40, 50, 60 percent salary hikes. Uh, uh, sort of be, ESOPs were making a lot of money. So I think that phase uh, is still something which, of course, I remember. And that's what we're discussing in CNBC TV 18 Investment Guide. Okay, and to discuss that, uh, we have with us uh, Ritam Desai, head of India Equity Research. Uh, and India Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Ritham, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to the show. Now, you know, talking about this cycle, right, 2003 to 7 cycle, uh, uh, do you think we are somewhere in that cycle or is this phase reminding you of some other cycle? So, so the, the challenge with markets is that every bull market, every bear market is different. Uh, there is some uh, resonating, uh, you know, there's some something will resonate with some period in the past. Uh, but you, uh, yeah, I think this comes quite uh, much closer to the 0307 phase than uh, other phases. Uh, it's certainly not like the 91, 92 bull market. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, prior bull markets like the one in uh, 84, 85 was also very different. So in terms of mega bull markets, you know, there have been these three big bull markets in Indian history. Uh, this one probably compares more with uh, the 03, 07 phase. Uh, global factors uh, seem to be similar, uh, and local factors also appear to be shaping up in a similar fashion. So uh, I would say that it looks like that period. Okay, Rhythm, uh, great to have you on the show. Thank you for um, you know making the time for us. And we want to ask you a lot more. If it is looking similar to 2004 to 7, what are the similarities? And also on a larger sort of note, uh, do phases and cycles always repeat uh, almost absolutely similarly? Or will uh, cycles have their own uh, different texture and flavor as well? So what are the comparisons here? See, I'll take the second part of the question first because that's an easy one. Uh, bull markets or bear markets all follow very similar patterns in that sense, uh, in the way prices behave or in the way sentiment behaves. They start with uh, a mood of extreme pessimism, which then uh, converts itself into doubt. Uh, then it converts itself into some uh, degree of optimism. And finally, a bull market ends with euphoria. Bear markets start at the peak of euphoria, and then uh, they, they trough when, uh, when people are extremely depressed, um, like they were in, uh, say, March uh, last year. So that's the similarity with all these market cycles, irrespective of which asset class you talk about, whether it's gold, whether it is equity shares, it doesn't matter. Uh, now, on the first part of the question, that's a little bit more specific. Um, how does this compare? Uh, so uh, the starting points were not very dissimilar. Uh, let's assume for a moment that the starting point of this bull market was the last week of March last year, uh, when the Nifty was trading at around 7,600. Uh, that was around 1.7, 1.8 times book. And guess what? In March 2003, which was the book, which was the, actually 25th April 2003, I remember the date, um, of, the, of that bull market, at the trough, 
the nifty was again trading at 1.7 times so identical multiple then that bull market peaked uh, with the market going all the way to 4.8 times book so the valuations uh, on a book multiple almost tripled in that four year period or four and a half year period um, uh, the sensex or the nifty companies compounded earnings at about 30% every year so the book value also compounded and therefore the sensex went from around 2800 to peak at about 21000 which is what about a nine time increase i'll ask you a question before i continue do you know what india's market cap was in uh, in uh, march 2003 any I guesses I wouldn't have the number, um, but I'm just wondering how we've moved on book value now. I mean, just hearing you speak. No, I said, what do you do? You do you have any guess on what the market capitalization of the Indian stock market around, was? Around five lakh crores, Ridham. Okay, so uh, I have the number in dollars. It was a hundred and twenty billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's um, yeah, that's that's roughly so, five lakh crores. Yeah. and it peaked in january 2008 at about 1.5 trillion dollars mm. okay this uh, march uh, we were down to around 1.2 1.3 trillion dollars so the ma march market cap was equal to the peak of 2008 but of course 12 13 years have passed since then uh, so there are similarities in terms of how the valuation shaped up uh, from the bottom uh, we don't know the top of this bull market but if that bull market is an indication then you know uh this bull market could peak at about 5 times book we're currently at about 3.5 3.6 times book mm. uh mind you that doesn't mean uh, uh that the peak is uh, is uh, 30 40% ahead uh yeah. because it takes time so in the meanwhile as the book compounds mm. uh, there could be a lot more upside before we're done okay the second similarity and i think this is the most important thing is about the policy environment So if you look at the period between 99 and two, or 98 and 2003 the then government had shifted emphasis from uh, boosting the share of labor in gdp to boosting the share of profits in gdp so there are two ways in which you can grow the economy you can grow it by making the labor class richer so the labor gets more income it then spends so consumption goes up that lifts capacity utilization and that causes companies to invest as companies invest it creates more jobs and you get a virtuous cycle and gdp goes up the other way is that you boost the share of profits in gdp and therefore you get an investment cycle which then causes uh, job creation and wages go up consumption comes in and that creates a virtuous cycle of more investments and output goes up mm -hmm. now my belief is and i'm not an economist uh, i've debated this with a few other economists who do not necessarily agree with this that india has is a country with excess labor and supply shortages and therefore it's the second model which is the one that approaches from the uh, share of profits which works better than approaching this from the share of labor mm. and that is exactly what the government did between 99 and 2003 it undertook several policy measures to try and boost the share of profits mm. in in uh, gdp now Uh, that particular government didn't see the fruits of its labor because we had a government change in 04 but between uh, 2003 and 2007 the share of profits in gdp went from 2% to 7% mm. and the nominal gdp of course was growing at about 13 14% so when you add that up you got that 30% compounding in earnings now a similar thing is happening here the seeds this time around was sown in september 19 mm. so in 2006 the then government in late 2006 enacted the manrega act and marked a shift in policy away from boosting share of profits back to boosting the share of wages mm. for 13 years that policy impetus remained mm. and clearly it did not help boosting gdp because we got a round of inflation mm. and we got a round of bad loans and it caused corporate sentiment to sink mm. and investment stalled and therefore job creation slowed down and wage growth slowed down eventually and therefore it affected the output in 2019 september i sense there was a marked shift in government uh, policy uh, through the massive corporate tax cut the government basically said we're going to go back to mm. trying boost uh, the share of profits in gdp and i think the finance minister said on your channel when she was asked Uh, the question of what is there in this particular budget for uh, 
the working class she said i am investing money it will create jobs okay. and will create wage growth and that thinking i think is very critical mm. we've seen several moves uh, over the past 12 months whether it's production linked incentives whether it's the new labor laws uh, the corporate tax cut and several other things in this budget okay. which basically point in this direction the government mm. is now committed to reward mm. the entrepreneur to get profit share in gdp back mm. up and rising and therefore create an investment cycle which will then create jobs and will create prosperity for Got the that. working class Got and i think this is the right model for india to approach and it will result in mm. uh, like we saw in 0307 mm. uh, a pretty uh, strong uh, performance of share prices got that now there's a third there's a third factor which is very important in all this which we should not ignore which is the global factor mm. that period in 0307 also marked a secular decline in the us dollar, dollar. yeah because the because the fed had its pedal uh, had its foot on the pedal and it seems like now that mm. the fed is committed at least that's the mongus and view the fed is committed to keep interest rates low for a foreseeable for a really long period uh, because it is committed to keep it, get inflation in the us back up to 2% and keep it there Uh, which has not happened in the last 12 13 years since the global financial crisis okay. so we may be in a longer term dollar decline okay. which augurs extremely well for indian stocks okay got that uh, so prithvi uh, you know i have to ask you this follow up then uh, that was the phase then in which infrastructure did the best right i still remember the prices of bhel lnt gmr All these stocks. The associates of the I mean, world, yeah. Which that, that's course. a you know poor reminder or not a great reminder, but still, you know, some of these stocks did did really well. Uh, are you seeing shades of that play out now? Could that be the space to be in? So, Nanuj, you are absolutely right. Uh, from uh, measured from the bottom of O three to the top of O eight, the best performing sector in India was industrials, and I dare say industrials may again turn out to be a very very strong performing sector. but the best performing sector i think this time around could be consumer discretionary mm. so industrials will be a close second or maybe uh, right up there but i think discretionary consumption will do extremely well because india's income has changed and there is a very big uh, transformation happening in the consumption basket back then which is almost 20 years ago india was still consuming very basic stuff now we have started migrating out of that per capita income has grown we're about 2000 dollars a large portion of the population is now about basic needs and once that happens you know the the share of food in your consumption basket doesn't go up as you as much as your income so it actually creates a lot of spare income to spend on other stuff so the growth in non food consumption is a whole lot faster than income growth um so i sense that discretionary consumption will probably be the best performing sector and industries will follow up uh, closely now the problem is in industrials is that a lot of the companies that were in existence then have actually shriveled and have even closed down and ceased to exist so a new set of companies will be required and we don't have such a broad universe of uh, industrial companies like uh, we had then uh, so again that favors you know uh, discretionary consumption because that's a much bigger sector in terms of choice of businesses uh, that one can uh, participate in Okay, got that rhythm. We have a lot of ground to cover. We have lots of other questions to know how to prep up for this new bull market. We'll take a break and come right back, and also, of course, talk about this whole concept of the big getting bigger. What does that mean for your portfolios? Back in a moment. Welcome back. You're with us on the CNBC TV 18 Investment Guide, and we are in conversation with Rhythm Desai of Morgan Stanley. Now, Rhythm, you gave us some sense of you know uh, the pockets to look at in the market: uh, uh, discretionary consumption and, of course, industrials. Now, let's talk about size, because over the last couple of months, what we've all heard repeatedly is that big is getting bigger. So, what does that mean in terms of stock selection? Do you stick with more with large caps, with blue chips, or is this the time to actually go beneath the surface? and seek out those mid caps and small caps for alpha so there are two things about this uh, surpi one is that we are coming out of a 10 year uh, sluggish uh, growth performance when uh, growth is sluggish uh, the the pie available to businesses you know it doesn't grow 
and that is always unfavorable to smaller firms who do not have the same cost dynamics as larger firms. So larger firms get bigger, and smaller firms suffer. And this has been what has been this has been the case for India as well, uh, particularly over the last two and a half three years when economic conditions have been very challenging. Uh, that will change if growth picks up. So our view is that growth actually should do quite well over the next several quarters. And if growth picks up, the pie gets larger, pie gets larger, smaller businesses actually have more operating leverage and they will do well. So I think, uh, you know, this concentration, and we call it concentration of both profits as well as market cap may have seen its peak and may have seen its peak in December itself. Uh, so that may already be starting to decline. And you'll see that uh, the profits of the broader market may grow faster than that, those of the Nifty and Sensex. And the market cap may also expand faster. So that's the first point. Now, this is happening within a, a bigger overarching uh, phenomenon of disruption. Uh, now, disruption is a much, you know, it's an overly used word. Uh, disruption has always been the uh, case for uh, businesses all through the history of the world. Um, and I won't spend more time discussing that, but you know, just go back to the 1870s to know what disruption was. Because in a single decade, we had a telephone, we had an automobile, and uh, and um, and it completely altered the way people communicated and traveled. Um, so, uh, in fact, I wouldn't say the disruption that's happening right now even comes close to what we had seen then, 150 years ago. Uh, we also got electricity, by the way, then. Uh, so imagine. Uh, but disruption is an ongoing thing, and uh, therefore you have to be very careful, especially with smaller businesses, because they can get easily disrupted with the technology changes that are happening. So when investors go around selecting that, of course, I think smaller businesses, generally speaking, should do better. Uh, but within that, you have to be careful uh, that you're not buying a business that's getting disrupted because of some tech change that is happening in the world at large. Okay, Rhythm. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, time permitting, I'll come back to, to that question for a follow-up on that. But, uh, you know, a two-part question. What's in the current cycle, what's the biggest risk to the market? And over a three-year period, uh, what are the factors to remember while making portfolios? So, Anuj, I would say two risks. One is that uh, at any point in time, if the market starts believing that the Fed has fallen behind the curve, then I think you have a problem. Uh, because uh, the Fed is still, uh, you know, the, the central bank that matters. And when the market believes that the Fed has fallen behind the curve, share prices will fall everywhere, and India will not be spared. Uh, and as a, you know, as a trailer, you know, remember what happened in the taper tantrum in 2013. Uh, so that's, you know, something to keep in mind. Uh, the fact is that we think inflation is coming back in America. We also think that the Fed is going to be highly tolerant of that. But you know, the market perception around this is going to be crucial. The second is, of course, the risk factor at home. There's a lot of execution. Uh, there's great commitment that the government is uh, demonstrating about policy shift. Uh, the budget was a big surprise of the upside. But uh, you know, it still leaves a lot of work to be done. Uh, so for example, you know, the privatization of public sector banks uh, that is being proposed uh, has a lot of work uh, you know, in the background that needs to be completed. So we have to keep an eye on execution, and hopefully that happens. And if that happens, then I think we should be okay. Because then, you know, the point I made on policy will play out, uh, and the share of profits in GDP will go up. So okay. those are the two uh, things I think investors need to bear in mind with a medium-term view. Okay, Rhythm, I just want to go back uh, on the point of industrials because the words ring so true, right? We have seen the demise of many companies in the last 10 to 15 years. So for those who are going to be focusing on the infrastructure sector, industrials once again, what are the most important perhaps parameters to, to keep in mind? I mean, there's l and and then there's life beyond l and which is the argument that you just made. So, I mean, what kind of filters to look at, how to analyze uh, some of these uh, infrastructure and industrial firms? So, see, Subi, so I wouldn't distinguish between industrials or a consumer company. There are only three things that you look for when you buy a stock. You look to back good people, uh, people with character and people who are, uh, 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 who are honest. Uh, because if you get into a business that's managed by bad actors, then uh, the result is usually bad. Why usually? It's always bad. You want to buy a decent business, not something that doesn't have uh, much traction, uh, something that is scalable. Uh, scalability is a very important thing in, uh, in, uh, in the stock markets. Um, so you wouldn't pay 
uh, multiple to you know a carpentry business for example because there is limited scalability there so this is just a stray example that i gave so scalability and therefore that's the second thing and the third thing is the price you pay for it i mean the a business may have both the first two factors but if you end up paying a very steep price then you don't make money so it doesn't matter whether it's an industrial or a consumer business or a bank i think these are the three things that you're looking for good people scalability uh, of the business uh, of a good business and uh, you know a proper price it doesn't have to be a very uh, discounted price you know as chali manga has said you pay a reasonable price for a good business you make money uh, you don't have to buy the business below uh, well below fair value because good businesses tend to surprise on the upside with respect to their cash flows and therefore you get compensated in the long run even if you pay fair value you end up making money okay that's a very nice way to end but that was not my favorite statement of the show my favorite statement of the show the rhythm was that it's the you know the the right now is the best time to be an entrepreneur uh, i think for a lot of people listening that's uh, perhaps uh, a good advice rhythm thank you so much for joining us always good talking to you thank you all right well on that note uh, we are going to wind up uh, this edition of the cnbc tv 18 investment guide remember we always look out for your feedback your comments questions any new names you want to hear from tell us and we will get the experts to you see you next week